Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And welcome to the Space and Mars panel. Our name is Salvador Capella and Puyak and Ashmas in Kashnakati. We are members of the Next Gen Family Steering Committee. For the past year, we and our colleagues, Marina Sim, together with Ina Shepard of the Working Heart, put together this panel. The panelists here are all coming after the selection process that went to a harsh competition. Um, sharing their work and their experience and the ways to have the match of the spectrum that we will be able to bring here in the panel today. Uh, we would like to thank all the people that supported the creation of the panel and the moderator and the panelists for the effort. They've been going through a process for the whole summer where we kept reading and rehearsing and practicing to the good of them. Um, we would also like to thank the IF Workforce Development and Professional Program Committee the IAF Space Education and Outreach Committee, ISEP for hosting us here and in the National Student Zone today, uh, as well as Cotton Mary and Color Panel for having helped us prepare the panelists on stage. Uh, finally, also to thanks to SGC and Robertson from the IAF for having helped us spread out uh, the points about this panel. Uh, now I will look forward to Priyanka to introduce you to our panelists and moderator. Thank you, Matteo. So we have a rather distinct Set of panels and of course our moderator. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce to our audience this wonderful uh, set of people here. So Dr. Chris Osthausen is an Australian astronaut, scientist, entrepreneur, investor and musician, currently a partner at ECDC, a deep tech investment company in San Francisco, where he focuses on funding cutting edge space companies. Chris worked first at NASA Ames Research Center in California, established the Singularity University, and co-created the NASA Foresight. After NASA, he co-founded uh, co Planet Labs, the first company to employ nanosatellites in a commercial capacity to be operating the largest fleet of Earth observing satellites. He, has, he was the 2014 Advanced Global Australian of the Year Award winner, and has subse subsequently become a member of the Advanced Board of Directors where he is an active spokesperson for successful Australians abroad. Chris is a musician on top of that and releases music under the name Dr. Chris P. Last but not least, he flew to space as a commercial astronaut on Blue Origin's New Shepard NS-18 mission on October 13, 2021, this year. Now I leave the floor to you, Chris. Welcome and please enjoy the Thanks for having me here. Thanks for that very warm introduction, and uh, it's really great to be here at the IAC. Um, I had a dream many years ago when I was um, first coming to the IAC that I'd love one time to the peak of success at IAC would be for me to DJ here one time. And so, in the spirit of this panel, I'll actually be playing tomorrow night at Yuri's night. And so, after 20 years, I, I think I finally realized that. And so, this is a really interesting panel where we're going to talk about putting the A back in STEM, talking about STEAM. And as someone who's now come back to music, it's quite interesting reflecting on my history with art because when I was a PhD student, I was also trying to learn guitar and I remember in a fit of madness selling my guitars because I couldn't practice four hours a day and write a thesis at the same time. I think many of you can relate to the tension between your art and your passion and your study and your career and your work. And so, you know, this is a new era where it's okay to be a slash person, to have many interests, and for those to be public, for people at work to know about your private life and what you do at home. And for, you know, through social media, everything's visible, and so we no longer really live in this dichotomy where you have to pick and choose. So I'd love to like introduce our amazing panel here, who are all doing amazing work in, in, in both in science, education, technology, and in the arts. And so without further ado, let me begin. We're gonna go down the panel, we're gonna spend about couple of minutes each doing introductions and then we're going to do a little couple of questions from me and the, the people who introduce themselves I'll ask the questions and then we'll open the floor up for questions here as well and give a good amount of time for people to ask questions so if you have any questions in the last half uh I don't know if we have a mic but stick your hand up and we'll jump to questions so without further ado starting here with Shamira let me introduce Shamira Andres so she is a really talented ballerina a classically trained uh, ballerina and choreographer um, has studied uh, planetary geophysics, glacial, um, ice and glacial and permafrost using radar and light in the Arctic. He's also president of SETS. So now let's uh, hear about your art. Hi, so uh, my name is Shamira Andres. I'm a 
Thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. So, like Chris said, uh, my name is Shamira. It's pronounced like Shakira, but with an M. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm a PhD student in Earth and Space Science and Engineering in Toronto, Canada, and also in the Université de Nantes here in France. So, I also double as a dancer and an artist, a choreographer, and a teacher, and trained in R.A.D. Chikani Boganova Ballet, if you're familiar with those and also contemporary improvisation, hip-hop, and all other types of dance. As you probably saw in our opening ceremony, we had some break dancing. This is the first time I've ever seen a dance performance done in a space conference, so that was pretty refreshing for me. And I actually, for my research, I study radar on Mars and on Earth, so I do field work in the Canadian Arctic, as well as radar sounding and ground penetrating radar for future Mars exploration, um, human exploration, uh, to give insight for the International Ice Mapper mission. So that's an uh, international co collaboration mission that we're providing a radar instrument. Canada is providing a radar instrument. But however, although Mars has a very special place in my heart in planetary science, I also dance, obviously. And since I was young, I've always told my parents that I wanted to be a dancing astronaut. So, till this day, I aspire to be one of the first astronauts to land on the moon and perform a full-length dance piece and putting the arts in front of... Sorry! And putting the arts in front of research and innovation, like, really at the stage of the spotlight. Um, so, I'm also a huge advocate for STEM education and putting arts also back in STEM and especially representing underrepresented minorities and communities in the Arctic or everywhere in the world. Um, at York University, I'm part of a graduate, I'm a, a graduate associate at Sensorium, which is a digital media arts department, and I collaborate with live coders, which are people who program on the fly and kind of sonify, which um, Nikki will talk about later, and make sounds with planetary data sets. So I use their, their data and I use my data and we combine concepts and we create dance pieces and performances, such as this, which is a work in progress. This, is, this one is called Mars Sets, it's a play on words for Martian sunsets. Um, and I'll show you a little bit more of some of the concepts and pieces that we've, I've made um, and hopefully inspire you to do some arts and science and both. And also, I know often you don't really look at it as this, but dance is great and performance and movement is really crucial for not only artistic expression, but also for the development of space culture and media. Um, I think really movement and dance, or gravity even, or the lack thereof in space really transforms how we move as, as, as humans, right? So we really need to understand this fundamentally, not only in STEM, but also show that and provide access to this with the arts, to people who are not STEM related. Um, but thank you so much. That's all I have to say for now. Thanks, Shamira. So yeah, being a dancing astronaut sounds pretty amazing. So. Cool, so next up we have Michelle Lenz, and Michelle um, is a PhD student in Chicago, and she has a lot of experience and expertise in extreme environments. In addition to also being a Russian trained ballet dancer, Michelle is also an avid freediver, um, and a, a strong advocate and fighter for inclusion and diversity in, uh, in our industry. So, um, Michelle, please tell us about what you do. Sure. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle, I use they don't pronouns, and I'm a PhD student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the Aero Astro Department. My research focuses on human experience in isolated, extreme, confined and extreme environments, and also how to design architecture to help astronauts live happy and healthy lives in space. When I was six, I visited the Field Museum in Chicago, where I tried on an astronaut suit for kids, and from there I fell in love with space flights. And kind of like Shamir, I've always wanted to say that uh, I want to be an astronaut on Mars and eventually live in a home that I designed in space. So I feel very grateful to have found an intersection of human factors, design, and engineering where I can pour my passion into and engage the public in discussions of STEM and art and what that means for our future. So for my research specifically, um, I, as Chris mentioned, I'm a, a Russian Romanov School ballet trained ballet dancer and also an avid free diver. So I was inspired by the similarities between diving and dancing and being in microgravity. So I wanted to study the concept of fluidity, which we often talk about in dance and underwater, 
And I wanted to use fluidity as a metric to measure the adaptation process of our movements in space. So our proprioceptive system, which is responsible for the control and awareness of our movements, is adapted for Earth gravity. So it changes really drastically when we go into microgravity. So I prototyped this wearable sensor system data uh, to collect kinematic data across the body and to use that to assess the fluidity changes between ground and microgravity and then throughout microgravity to see if there are differences in the fluidity of our movements. So this project successfully flew on parabolic flight this May, uh, which I'm really excited about, I'm excited to get into the data and analyze it. Outside of my academia work, I'm uh, very passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I'm currently the Outreach and Diversity Chair for my graduate association, as well as mentor young students, especially underrepresented students, looking to apply to graduate school, since I found that personally to be a barrier um, that I had to face as well. Um, in the general research that I do, designing space architecture, I'm really passionate about bring a new perspective to the world of habitat design and engaging people in thinking about what does architecture mean for the future of humanity and especially what does space architecture look like as architecture of its own and not just you know sending something from Earth that we built into space. So I really believe in the next few decades we have a really special opportunity to bring back the human into human space flight and I'm excited to contribute my unique perspective. That's amazing, Michelle. And um, I guess if we're going to go to you know, eventually live on the moon and Mars, those uh, locations are going to become historic sites. So we should make them good, right? <coughs> so, awesome. So next up we have uh, Nikki Sajad. So Nikki's a PhD student who's developing a hardware simulator to model in space and which is a very important topic. Nikki also learned down at age 10. He's a multi instrumentalist. I believe he did a performance in space to bridge in Congress and everything. Uh, just, just love the weather. And uh, you love doing improvisation with human instruments. So please tell us about your work. Hello, everyone. My name is Nikki Sazo, and my pronouns are Shiko. I'm a PhD candidate in space engineering at the Space Research Laboratory of K and C University of The main focus of my research is, is on developing the hardware and the simulation system for in orbit space that we might need. I'm also the national point of contact for my country, Iran at the Space Generation Advisory Council and try to connect Iranian students with the international space community. So I have a genuine interest in a wide variety of topics from art to engineering and try to find ways to combine these interests and discover relationships between them to convey messages. So I started playing piano at the age of 10 and have learned five instruments since then. During the pandemic, we saw an increased turn to the arts. Nobody could turn to art as an expression of strength and universal human connection. So when our space lab was closed, I found enough time at home to spend on creating pieces of music. And it developed to the extent that I really wanted to find a connection between those compositions and my experience in satellite technology. So it was a big surprise for me to find many inspiring people, like blind scientists who devoted their life to data scientification. And I discovered that uh, mapping data into pitch and volume can better interpret information to people, like the public and non-scientists. So I started a project on data scientification, to sonify data thing obtained from Earth observation satellites hear the voice of crisis we're facing. So when music notes now are concentration of greenhouse gases, water level, trapped heat in the atmosphere, or even the animal migration rate over time. So all these together can make a more possible. Like to send the sound of these crises to everyone. After receiving feedback from people, I now believe that music can show the importance of satellite in our love. Art is a common language that connects us together and to space. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Nikki. So next up we have um, 
Farul Sh uh, Shahira, and so Farul is a primary school educator and was very blessed to grow up in a place with amazing dark skies in Malaysia and uh, which has inspired a lot of your art. You're a pioneer of something called cosmic expressionism. And uh, so tell us about that. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everyone. My name is Farul Shahira, Binti Nazarude. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm from Malaysia. I grew up in a dark, in a rural part of the country where the night sky is really dark and light pollution is minimal. I started stargazing when I was seven years old and many nights of looking up at celestial objects flourished into deep passion, astronomy and space science. Situated far away from the latest news and updates about space science and science in general, I gathered any information I could obtain from old magazines, newspapers, books, and started sharing them with my peers at school. Seeing the faces of people who are very fascinated in discovering new knowledge about space science motivated me to educate the people around me. Now, I am a primary school educator, cultivating the young minds to be adventurous in their learning and imaginative in exploring new subjects. And just by my artistic prowess, I am pursuing my second career as a space artist, thus becoming the International Association of Astronomical Artists member. I create space art using traditional mediums such as watercolor and acrylic paint and adopted the style of cosmic expressionism. I work together with talented and professional space artists all around the world to implement and participate in astronomical and space art projects to promote education about astronomical art and to foster international cooperation in the artistic work inspired by the exploration of the universe. Furthermore, I incorporate my teaching skills to become a space art communicator pioneering the space art movement in my home country, Malaysia. I collaborated with Malaysian National Planetarium in organizing the first virtual space art exhibition to the public and connected them with the space artists from the International Association of Astronomical Artists to explore the future of space art and the work of space artists in advancing space science. My upbringing also led me to protect the dark night sky and I became the advocate for Dark Sky Malaysia and the International Dark Sky Association. My work involves providing visual messages about light pollution issues which gradually rocks away the night, dark night sky away from us all the while endangering the ecosystem. Visual art is vital in bridging complex knowledge such as space science and the dark night sky awareness to the public, making it more approachable. And I aspire to create more artworks in bringing everyone together in this field. I, I forgot to mention, we will uh, in the next section show some of the amazing art that our panelists have created, so uh, stay tuned for that. So last but not least, we have Sejul Bukbukholia, and so, uh, Sejul is an uh, analysis engineer at Collins Aerospace, uh, also a dancer, and um, chair of uh, chairs of SEDS in India, and um, is very, uh, a very strong advocate for breaking up the differences in society, and has some very interesting and uh, often overlooked uh, dimensions to diversity and inclusion that we'll look at today. So please, Sejul, tell us about your work. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for being here. My name is Seja Bukholia and my pronouns are she and her. I recently completed my bachelor's in mechanical engineering from India and currently work at Collins Aerospace as an analysis engineer. I've been a part of various space organizations and non-profits such as SETS India where I serve as the chairperson and I was the national representative for SETS Earth. At the Space Generation Advisory Council, I'm a part of the regional team of Asia Pacific and I serve as the lead co-editor for a book, Dormi Inter Astra, A Home Among the Stars, where we aim to highlight the story of a young girl from the northeast part of India who not unlike myself aims to go to space one day. I'm also an off-site student, a design program that aims at disrupting design education. 
and I've been involved as a dancer and artist there as well. But most importantly, I think all of us here have really personal motivations and stories for why we got into space, and here is mine. You see that picture there of, of the young girl sitting on my lap? I was a volunteer at a cancer home where I went to teach dance, and as that little girl sat on my lap, I asked her, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And I think for, uh, the answer for most of us here would be an astronaut or a scientist or an artist and definitely to go to space one day. But that little girl looked at me and said, well, what could I possibly be? And then that's when it hits you and that's when you realize that there's an entire section of society who believe that they don't have the privilege to hope and to dream and to have big dreams and ideas that they can achieve. And this is exactly what I want to break down. As the co-founder of Project NASA, we teach the underprivileged performing arts, especially focusing in dance. And as a part of the Swarovski Foundation, Creative for our Future Cohort, I've had the privilege to bring my ideas of menstruation in space in collaboration with the United Nations Office for Partnerships. I believe that the combination of the arts and engineering is inevitable, and we need the support of both of them if we're going to go to space and further someday. Thank you. Let's have a look at some art. So I think Shamira, we might have a we might have the video of yours that we can see. We do. Yeah. Let's have a look. Yes. So this is quite long, but I'll kind of talk over it. Um, so this piece was made probably in 2017, and when I was the captain and the president of my university's varsity dance team, and it won first place out of all of Canada. Um, so that this large group right here for all of the amazing dancers, and it's inspired by the moon of Saturn called Titan. So if you've heard of Titan, there's a mission going there, Dragonfly. Um, and it's inspired because it's called the undertow. So I, it was inspired by the undertow in oceans and ocean worlds and icy worlds. So that's kind of the, I'll let you watch it. But this whole entire piece is supposed to be showing connectivity and interactivity with the waves of the dancers and if you can tell the costumes are supposed to be actually shades of blue. I almost burned down my house, Megan was with my mom, <laughs> dying these costumes. But yeah, so it was pretty amazing just putting this together with such a beautiful, amazing, talented group of people and so I just hope to continue that. So this was during my undergrad degree uh, because I just could not let it go. Um, so that's the title of this piece. And Hopefully you can talk, talk more about others. Yeah, so how, how did you balance your passion? I'm quite curious as someone who had to make the choice to sort of focus on studying. I'm curious how do you balance this and studying and, and all of the other things you're doing? Yeah. What's the secret? Yeah. So I think there, one time I heard, there's no secret. Um, I think one time I heard that nothing is impossible. Possible just takes time. And so I don't know if anyone in the audience is an artist or artists or dabble in art. You can raise your hand, yes. And you can keep your hand raised if you're a full-time artist. That's awesome, as a career as well. Yes, so that's awesome. And I just, it's kind of sad because I just see those hands go down and that was also me in the beginning of my career because I was supposed to actually get a degree in arts, in dance performance. So I made a mission to actually go to a dance school and actually do that as a career. But I also really love science, and so I didn't really know how to balance it both. I had to choose. And most likely, you have to choose also. But there's a stigma in arts in general, not just in dance performance, as a vocal artist, as a guitarist, as a musician, as an artist, that you're going to be broke, homeless, in the streets of New York. So that is not the case. Um, <laughs> but I really just believe in balancing a good mental health and also good... Um, I, artistry and identity. So whatever you identify with, I kind of just chose something that I can combine with. So you might probably see, oh, physics and arts, they don't make sense together. It's a full 180. But there's always a way to communicate this because for me, dance performance is essentially just a non-verbal way of communicating. So like Nikki said, it's a universal language. So if you were to dance and you were speaking a different language verbally, I don't care because you're dancing if it's the same language with my body. So that's what, what really inspires me to talk more about movement, talk more about dance. And I'm proposing some initiatives
traditionalists also do the very first duet performance in microgravity. So there's been some solo performances done as well, but the first duet in parabolic flights would be really interesting. So I think that's my next step. That's very cool. That's amazing. So Michelle, you um, you mentioned space architecture, and I, I think that's a topic that's really fascinating because I don't think it's one that that many engineers really pay attention to. Our designs are functional. Um, so. Tell us more about that. What does it mean? What does it look like? Yeah, I think in the history of space flight, we've built many structures and many habitats, but most of those by necessity have had to be functional and have had engineering constraints put at the forefront. Now I think we have a really privileged opportunity to begin thinking about future architecture without mass and volume constraints. Um, thanks to in situ resource extraction and um, heavy launch loads, that we have this opportunity to rethink what architecture means. And much like the architecture that's on Earth, space architecture is not just about habitat design. It's actually about all the things that architecture means on Earth as well. So like the pyramids of Egypt, like the Eiffel Tower, these are, these are uh, symbols of our civilization and kind of these uh, symbols of culture and political and economic importance. Much like space architecture, I want to investigate how they can serve as these icons and as beacons for what it means to be a humanity, whether that be exploration or curiosity, um, what space architecture can look like in the future. And so my work is also focused on um, bringing behavioral health into the architectural design process since so much of architecture here on Earth is about the people who live there, I think there is a need and an opportunity to redesign architecture in space and to think about who are the people that are going to live there in the future. It's not just old white men anymore who get to be astronauts, um, but it's many of us, many of us who are not going to be trained as traditional astronauts who are going to be living there in the future. So I think that calls for a redesign of what space architecture can look like. And hopefully by doing that, then space will become more inclusive and accessible regardless of your background and regardless of your training. This is a photo of me free diving off the coast of Taiwan. So it's also an inspiration to me with this well. Yeah, that's a pretty epic photo. As a fellow freediver, I can relate to the being able to move in the, the Z axis and have the freedom to move up, down, left, and right, just like you're in space, which is a remarkable feeling. So, thanks for sharing. So, Nikki, we often hear about visualization data and, and you know, taking science data and putting it in an infographic or something that people can look at, but we don't really ever hear about sonification of data. So, you do a lot of this, so tell us about what, the, what is that word for sonification and how is it used and how are you using it? Thank you so much. Uh, so sonification basically means instead of having some figures of data, you hear that. Uh, so it's different case by case and it depends on what kind of information you want to convey, what kind of message you want to send to people. Uh, but I have an example and I want to talk about this example and you will hear that. Um, so, I really wanted to know about air pollution because my city uh, is an industrial city and we see that air pollution is one of the most important problems we have. So, I wanted to hear the voice of air pollution. Like, is it increasing? Is it increasing? So, it depends on the pH. Um, so, the first step is to find the right, right source of data set. So I gathered some data from NASA's Earth Data Platform consisting of some greenhouse gases. Um, and I mapped them into a range of frequencies. So you have frequencies now. And what you should do is to play them. So they are some nodes that you should play. And you can play them digitally using your computer, some software, or using your acoustic instruments. So here I will show you uh, a video which has my music on it and it's the concentration of greenhouse gases in my city. I should mention that it's from 1995 to 2022.
better open and you don't need any knowledge to read those data, read those features and lines. Yeah, that's very haunting and beautiful. Another round of applause for that. So Sejo, you mentioned cosmic things. Ah, oh, sorry. Sorry, the real sorry. Cosmic expressionism. So, um, the um, what does that mean? Like, do you have some examples you can show us? Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so tell us about this. This is your art, right? Yes. Yes. So please tell us. The cosmic expressionism, also known as swirly art by the International Association of Astronomical Artists. It is style in space art that is akin to post-impressionist era, which can be seen in the works such as Paul Cézanne, Giorgio Siret, and uh, our beloved Vincent van Gogh. And cosmic expressionists use color, shape, and form to give the viewer the artist's perspective and expression of the astronomical subject. And I am fully happy to be here, the place where post-impressionism was born. I created this series of painting called Memories of Leonard using Cosmic Expressionism style. And I was inspired by one of the nights observing Leonard Comet in 2021 with the local astronomers in Malaysian Observatory. And as both naked eyes and optical eyes focused on the comet, we were all watching the passing of our lifetime across the terrestrial sky. I worked on the art series as soon as I, was, as I was home to commemorate the memories of currently disintegrating comet and to express my emotions I felt during the observation. And for this artwork, I used watercolor on paper medium and adopted Van Gogh style. Yes, and this can be recognized um, by this bold dramatic brushstrokes that depicts movement in a seemingly static night sky. And the colors chosen for the background sky shows that the dark night sky is not entirely pitch black. And in the darkness, we can actually see more. And the main subject itself, which is the Leonard Comet, is visualized as a fiery streak of light crossing the night sky, which is an artistic expression of the real thing. And as we have witnessed from many shots taken by astrophotographers, the comet displayed a spectacular outburst induced iron tail. And in my opinion, it's best depicted incandescently in every art piece. Cosmic Expressionism embodies the artist's emotions and imaginations when they're immersing themselves in the wonders of cosmos through reading, research, and even observation. We feel that the tremendous, mysterious realm above the Earth is significant and strive to depict it in every of our artworks. And I invite all of you, the observer, to see the object the way I see and feel, exhibiting a poetic expression of the universe through the swirling brushstrokes and vibrant colors. These are absolutely beautiful, very moving pieces. Thank you. Thank you. Sejo, um, you're working on a project called Project Gaia, which is, um, you know, I think something that many people, maybe half the people in the world, haven't really thought about. And so, please tell us about that. What was the impetus for this amazing project? Uh, sure. Thank you for that great question. So, if you're sitting here and scrolling through Instagram or LinkedIn or any other social media, let me tell you, that's when you get the best ideas. And that's when I got the idea for this project as well. So the project here is Gaia. We deserve better period. And I was scrolling through Instagram one night where I came across a post that spoke about the absurd number of tampons that Sally Ride was asked to take when she went to space for one week. And that makes you think, you know, and I was like, no, that was a long time ago. That was before I was born. Things have changed. There's, there's got to be more information here. And I urge you now to Google menstruation in space. And I can guarantee you won't find more than two or three scientific articles about the same. There's not enough research, there's not enough articles, there's not even enough experimentation. And this is just the basic necessity that not only women, mind you, it's people who menstruate. It's not limited to just one gender. It's not limited to just people who identify as women. So this is a people's issue really and if we're all going to go and if we're all going to go together then 
it's high then that we talk about this. So the idea of the project is actually to ease the logistics of menstruation in space. Uh, so for anyone here who menstruates, if you've ever tried to change your sanitary products in a public washroom, it's got to be difficult. And you avoid traveling and you avoid going out at home. Now imagine the same in microgravity conditions. It becomes tenfold. And uh, irrespective of the product that you choose to you know, have when you're menstruating, it, it is difficult for you. But surprisingly, it's also difficult for people here on Earth. I spoke to women who served in the military and when they prayed in jungles and glaciers, they have to actually carry the used sanitary products back with them because they can't leave them there. So imagine carrying used sanitary products in your bag for days at an end just because you cannot dispose of them. And the same is faced by young girls in rural villages. And I've spoken to many of them and they say that, oh, you know what, when I menstruate, I just avoid going to school. Because what's the point? How am I going to change? And there's so much taboo around it. I don't want anyone to ask me. So what we're trying to do here with Gaia is build a product that can use and store your uh, used and unused sanitary products. And it can be placed in any position vertically. So if you're in microgravity, you can just fix it to a wall. If you're in an area where you don't necessarily have the table or the space to put your product, you can just put it on the side somewhere, even down, and then use it to store your used and unused sanitary products. I feel this one small step and focusing on these little things could have a huge impact. And I just like to conclude by saying that um, when I spoke about this idea to women in the military, presented them the final product description that we had and to these young girls in rural villages. You know what they said? And I know this is a project for space and I really hope we get to do this in microgravity and for astronauts. But that young girl uh, spoke to me and she said that, you know what, I can finally go to school now. And yes, I can go to school for the entire month without having to work. And I think that's the impact that space has on people. Because it's not just for what you're doing when you're up there, but also for the change that you can bring down here as well. Thank you. Thinking about uh, Michelle's point about um, space architecture, you know, we, if we really are sincere about space being for all people, we need to design it for all people so that all people can go there and use it comfortably and be there. So it's a really amazing project, so thanks for sharing it. So we have a few minutes for questions, and I have some more here as well, but um, does anyone in the audience have any questions for panelists? Yes, uh, so I saw a hand over there. Thanks so much. Um, amazing work from all the panelists. Um, it was really cool to see. Um, and as a person who that was a bit in music alongside my PhD research, I, um, it's inspiring to see that the two can come together as well. So I'd hope to do that in the future. Um, my research is on uh, machine learning. I'm sure uh, the panelists are all aware of, especially recently, the advantages in machine learning generative art. Um, I see that as something not replacing artists, but it kind of adds an additional tool that can be used. So um, could some of you possibly comment on the use of those tools and how you think that can help um, art for space as well? Who has some thoughts on machine learning? Yeah, I think much like all technologies, when they're incorporated with our art, I think it shows kind of the best of us, and it shows the, the creativity and the passion that we bring to our work, so I think that is very important. Um, my work in architecture also looks at smart habitats and predictive learning in our habitats and how they can learn our habits and help us do mundane tasks. So I see machine learning as really important, not just in generative art, but also with um, important applications in future architecture work. So that's my personal connection to machine learning. Uh, hey, thanks a lot for your presentation. My question is to Nirul. Um, so it's, it's great that you, you are doing all those um, pictures and uh, all the art stuff at the schools. 
So, have you ever thought of a simplified version of this to be applied in any, in any situation? Because I'm doing a lot of space outreach activities, especially in developing countries, and I've been to multiple orphanages, uh, primary schools, and I teach them basics of space. I'm a space engineer, by the way. Uh, uh, partial, um, partial giving lectures at the International Space University. So uh, I teach them a lot about space. We build some paper satellite uh, paper satellites together. Uh, but it would be great to have some simplified versions so that we can paint something in order to motivate the children from more space, but in a simplified version. So what can you say about that? Alright, so I have conducted a space art workshop for the astrophysics, physics and cosmology students before. So I, one of the activities is that I showed them uh, uh, this style of artwork. For example, the one that I've been, uh, I've been working on is Cosmic Expressionism. So I teach them a little bit about Cosmic Expressionism and told them to make a research about, let's give them a subject like comet. So they make a research about the comet. And then they immerse themselves into the information about the comments and eventually they come up with ideas on how to express those comments in form of cosmic expressionism, like the movements, emphasizing on the movements, the colors. Yes, and you can also make 3D arts. 3D arts also work, but that is not uh, in my expertise. Uh, mostly my work revolves around uh, 2D visual artworks. It can be also using watercolor. Watercolor is very easy. All students uh, learn it in school. I'm pretty sure all the panelists also learn about watercolors at school. Yeah, you can use a lot of medium. Art is not limited to just um, watercolor, acrylic, and oils. It can be 3D. It can be digital arts. Yes, it can be anything. Hello? Uh, my question is for Sajal. Uh, about the planet in space, uh, the issue we have right now in space with the planet uh, is not only uh, how to dispose of the used uh, projects, but also the fact that only one of the two toilets is uh, available to have the planet, and uh, the goal is to have all of the toilets uh, being um, in the circle for reusable water, so soon uh, no toilets will be usable for planets. So for now, women have to take the, the pill to go to space, so we can't send women with their biological aspect to space, that's a lie. Uh, so, the, have you talked about that with uh, anybody? Do you have any questions? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And thank you for that question. So, yes, uh, currently they are trying to do that, but uh, also having spoken to like flight surgeon and astronauts, while it is viable to have them take the pill, I, I personally believe it should be a choice. And we've surveyed over 350 people across the globe who, you know, who face and undergo menstruation, and not all of them are comfortable taking the pill. And as I think Michelle mentioned, not all of us are going to be uh, trained as a particular as astronauts. But if the space is going to be open to all, we're all going to be trained differently and have different expectations. Just in terms of the reusability, so menstrual blood, uh, some of the stem cells. I I have an engineering background, not so much biology, so I'm trying to learn as well. But those uh, that blood can actually be reused and we can use that for some regenerative cells so there is i think one research paper that you can find and i'll be happy to share it cited it in my work as well uh, so that's what we're trying to do next so uh, uh, as of now currently there are certain modes that people use like say sanitary napkins or tampons which are disposable but there are also more sustainable options such as menstrual cups and if we can find a way to optimize those in space and then reuse that menstrual blood, it could actually help us, uh, you know, sustain some of the agricultural aspects in space. So that, that is, a, you know, one thought process of what can be done uh, because it's actually not always, well, it's nothing that needs to be absolutely disposed. And I believe we can move to more sustainable practices as well uh, to use that in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Great, I think we have time for two more questions. So, one here and then we carry up front. Hello, you all have done a wonderful job. Congratulations. Uh, maybe to hear from those of you who are currently in your PhD, how do you find that art has made you better in your scientific degrees? That is a great question, thank you. I honestly don't think I could do my PhD the way I'm doing it now without what I have been trained to do in the arts before. 
So for my specific art, which is dance and performance, or theater, if you will, I think it really teaches you things that science does not, or STEM. For example, resilience, discipline, those are things that you kind of sense at a, at a young age. If you stick to one art, or if you just catch it up again, if you start late, I think all of this, uh, while complementing critical thinking and science, and also other things that you learn, Arts is very crucial to merge the two, and also communicate to how, how to communicate to different types of audiences is very important. So if you're talking to a little kid, obviously they don't know the technicalities of space flights and the ISS, so you may want to describe this to them in an action, or a photo, or an art, or so. Everyone always says that space is the gateway to STEM, however, it's not really at the forefront ever. So, like for example, no one makes, no, I, I guess, I, I know a few space artists now, but as a space artist, I don't think that is a career that is yet established. So I think we need to be more visible and provide more opportunities to these artists because it, they deserve to be seen and they teach you so much more than just being creative. Just to jump in also really quick. Um, I think if it weren't for my interest in architecture and in design, I wouldn't have found the niche of space architecture, which is so special and like really needed in the industry. And I also think in other in our other pursuits, we not only become more creative, but we also find different things to take into our research. Like when I'm free diving, I have to get in the Zen state, and that process is not something they teach you in graduate school, but has really become critical in terms of like facing stress and anxiety and just being able to let go all of all, all of that. Um, and going to the Zen state has been more helpful than I could have imagined. Yes, this is uh, directed towards um, yes. Sejal. Um, I think it's a great idea what you're looking at, uh, you know, the best ways to uh, help manage the period process in microgravity. But have you also considered as another way of extending uh, the ability for people to go into space, can you transfer that idea of that product to incontinence? So in other words, for the elderly people who may benefit from being in a microgravity environment, but who suffer from incontinence, you know, incontinence problems, they also need sanitary protection. So is uh, what you're doing extendable to that kind of um, work as well? Yeah, definitely, and I think it should be. Uh, so I haven't really thought in that direction, so this is a really new and great perspective for me. I think the crux of, of the research and why I started was always to see how we can use the space environment uh, to actually help life on Earth, and if this is something that could help, say, a wider range of audience, then uh, I would definitely be up for it to uh, you know, look into and explore that. Uh, there are two sides to this, so again, I, I believe as it should be a choice. So if you choose to menstruate naturally in space, there could be one direction and one line of like product design and product ideas that you could get into. But also if you choose to suppress it for the long run, there are certain ways to do that. Not everyone may choose to uh, menstruate naturally, so there are certain kind of like pills and tests that are being done and it's fairly a simple surgical process uh, that can be done also for space environment. So I believe that those can be mimicked to life on Earth for people who may benefit from them the most. Uh, but yeah, thank you for sharing that new perspective with me. I'm definitely going to look into it. That's great. So just before we wrap up, uh, we have a couple of little interesting things. We have a special announcement in a minute, but also at the very end of the panel, we would like to invite all of the space artists in the audience to come and join us for a space artist at IAC photo up here as well. So please stick around to the very end and join us for a photo. And before we move on to the next thing, please give a round of applause to thank our amazing panelists for the So, uh, Priyanka would like to come up, and we have a very special announcement to close out today's ceremony. Thank you, Chris, and uh, congrats again to the amazing panel. Uh, you guys are great. <laughs> so, I, I'm very excited to uh, announce something for you with uh, Aline. And 
uh, so we are members of the SIOP uh, committee, the Space Education and Outreach Committee. And uh, you are part of the historic moment here because we, <laughs> we would like to inaugurate the launch of the IF Art Gallery in support of SIOP. And um, so, first, thank you, thank you, Bianca, and those words. Thank you. You're all so creative. So, rather than discuss creativity as a buzzword, right? We we are making a real step towards launching the IF Vermont Art Gallery, and we want to reach, to in fact, bring together uh, space initiative, art initiatives. Space um, enthusiasts on creativity, and we want to create this art gallery as a permanent gallery, which will be virtual, and also it will be on Creative Commons International License 4.0. So everyone with an interest, their art will be as well protected. <laughs> we also have already the pilot project launch during the Space Generation Congress, and in conjunction with IAC. But also, all the art that is going to be collected throughout the year is going to be exhibited in IEC 23, in 2023, uh, on, uh, on Baku in Azerbaijan and receive the support from Azerbaijan Aerospace Agency. So thank you very much. And as well, now we invite you all to have a picture together. Thank you. So, just to wrap up, we did a pilot project with the Space Generation Advisory Council. And the art gallery is actually up. You can go to the website and have a look. And a uh, special announcement again. We would love to invite our panelists to collaborate together because we come from different backgrounds of art. And we'd love to create a piece of art that we can show at Buckley next year. So 